Okay, so at camp, uh, kind of like at regular church, we have messages as well. Um, and so I'll kind of dive into that right now. But first, would you mind praying with me? Uh, Father, uh, we thank you for this day. We thank you for being able to gather with you. Uh, and we thank you for being able to gather uh, with you with um, our other brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, so I thank you for that fellowship. Uh, now as we uh, dive into the message for the day, um, just uh, please speak through me. Um, let these not be my words, but your words instead. Uh, let the glory go to you, um, and just uh, help us understand, you know, what it means to be complete with you, um, and to drop the things around us in this world, but instead to keep our eyes set on you, and keep our eyes focused on you. We love you so much. Amen. So like I said, our theme for Wednesday at camp is uh, complete in Christ, and, and, and I think that's a pretty important message for us to give to lots of different ages, because being complete and finding complete and finding, finding out how to feel full in life is something that's kind of a struggle that I've seen at camp from the youngest of the young, where we have, you know, like preschoolers coming in, to even, you know, with grandparents, as they're starting to see, okay, you know, I'm going through other transitions in my life, and I'm trying to find this fullness. And it's hard for us not to get distracted um, from, from, from Jesus. You know, it's hard for us not to realize, it, it's hard for us um, to not, uh, how do I want to say this? We understand that the best way to get full is to accept Jesus into our lives. We understand that the best way to feel full is to have God in us. But that's kind of tough when we have so many distractions around us in the world. There's no doubt about it that um, in today's age, we have everything around us, and it's easy to try to fill up on those things. And it becomes unhealthy very, very quickly. Um, and so if I'm going to say a story that allows me to show just how easy it is to feel unhealthy when you're filling up on the wrong things, I want to tell you about a recent adventure that I had to Pizza Ranch. Um, the staff and, and I and a few other people, we went to Pizza Ranch on Friday night. And I'm not one of those people who really likes to dive into eating contests. I just really do enjoy food, but it's not like I'm like feeling too prideful about my eating. I'm like, I have to out eat you. But for some reason, something on Friday night absolutely clicked to where I was like, someone said something, you know, hey, you know, let's see who can have the most plates. Let's see who can have the most pizza. My boss, I knew the week before, had 15 pieces of pizza. And I'm like, let's see what I can do. So I'd say right around pizza number six, I was feeling content. I'd say right around pizza number 10, I was feeling full. Pizza number 12, I was feeling like I was about ready to be sick. Pizza number 14, I felt like I really needed to leave Pizza Ranch in a wheelchair. And then, but then, you know, I knew my boss, he had 15. You know, and so I'm filling up and I'm consuming and I'm trying to put these things inside of me because so literally, I'm filling up with nasty stuff, but also I'm trying to fill up on some ridiculous contest that means absolutely nothing. And that's silly, but we do that in our lives too. You know, we fill up on weird, strange things, and we even notice ourselves starting to feel sick. We notice ourselves starting to feel weird, but we keep on filling up, and we keep on trying to push ourselves a little bit harder because we think, well, if I just have a little bit more, then it's going to start to feel good, right? Then it's going to start to ease in. So I'm on pizza number 14. I go up and I get two more pieces. And uh, I'm feeling like I'm going to finish out on top. At Pizza Ranch, they have some thin slices. They have some thicker slices. So I'm like, all right, thick slices, let's go. So I'm sitting there, and my body starts to shake. You know what I'm saying? Like when you're, like too, you're way too full to continue eating. And, and I, I get to a point where I'm saying, like, I don't even like what I'm eating. And this is dessert pizza. This is as good as it gets. You know, this is supposed to fill me up. This is what's supposed to put me over at the top. Long story short, it didn't. And, and it's been a long weekend because of that. And it was a long Saturday. And, and whether or not you get this, I'll just let you know, after you eat that much, while you are full toward the end of the weekend, you feel very, very empty. And for a lot of different reasons. Because you get sick. You know what I'm saying? So we fill up on these things in our lives that we think are going to make us happy. Silly contests, silly pride, silly possessions, whatever that might be. But we continue to fill ourselves up because we think that is going to make us happy. So we apply that into our spiritual lives with Jesus. You know, we, 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 like I said earlier, we understand Jesus makes us full, but then we see the distractions of the world. And it's not just like sinful behavior necessarily all the time. Sometimes it's just, the, like I said, the distractions. You know, we have social media everywhere. We have contests for kids everywhere. We have uh, competition in our jobs. We, we think if I work harder, you know, then my family will be happy because, because I'm working harder for them. We think they'll understand that. But we fill up on these things that aren't meaningful for our spiritual life. Sure, everything is fine in moderation, just like Pizza Ranch in moderation is delicious, and I, I highly encourage you to go there, but 
when we completely pour everything we have into it, suddenly we feel empty. I read a study recently that said, outside of work, the average American is spending nine hours in front of a screen every single day. So that means whether it's your phone, TV, computer screen, tablet, we cannot get away from our screens. We dive into these things because we think that's what's going to keep on filling us up. If I just take in more content, if I just take in more media, it's going to give me the edge. You know? Or we go over to work. If I just work a little bit harder, if I just get that raise, then I'm going to be above my peers. Then I'll be happy. You know, if, if, you're, if you're younger and you're in sports, if I just work a little bit harder, if I just devote myself a little bit more, if I just make this my life, then I'll be happy. But the problem with that is that takes us from being human beings and it turns us into human doings. See, I think the reason why we're called human beings is because sometimes we're just supposed to be. But instead we get so caught up in doing and we just, and we turn around and we say, oh God, where did you go? And we're confused about it. We don't understand. Well, simply the reason is because we've been filling ourselves up with all these other things that just don't do it. About a month and a half ago, I was training for um, uh, my last, I ran track in college. I just graduated in the spring from Wartburg. And uh, I was training, I ran the heptathlon for indoor and I had competed in the decathlon for outdoor season. The decathlon is five events the first day, five events the second day, two day event. You combine them for a total, total points. And then whoever gets the most points wins. So about a month and a half ago, I'm training for the last one ever. It's the conference meet. Um, and that was kind of my goal. My goal was, OK, if I could just win conference, then I will be happy. If I could just get that conference title, things are going to be good. You know, then, then, then I'm going to be pumped up. Then I'm going to feel like this whole track experience in college is worth it. My freshman year, I felt like, OK, you know, I kind of came close. But there's this one kid you know, in the field who, who edged me out, and he was my age. Then the next year, I come back, and he edges me out again. But I'm like, OK, but by the time I'm a senior, I think I'll be ahead of him, and I think I can win. My junior year, I'm injured. And so I, you know, this guy who I competed, butted heads with for a while, he beat me. And suddenly, my senior year comes around, and, and I've got one chance left at this. So I'm going to do everything I possibly can. I got to a point where I'm going to practice for four hours a day, five days a week. And then on Saturdays, you compete. And then on Sundays, when you're supposed to have an off day, I still dove in for another two hours of training because I, this is my life. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to be remembered by. This is just this past spring. So about a month and a half ago, I'm getting ready for the conference meet. And I'm thinking about this kid who has always just edged me out by that little bit. And I. And I and now it's not even just if I win, it's now I need to beat him. Which is kind of sick because I actually get along with this guy very well. Really nice guy. But I wanted to beat him. This became my God. This became the one thing that I thought could make me complete. So I trained harder. I picked up about an hour each day. Tried to go a little bit more. Tried, tried to lift more, which doesn't work out too well for me. Tried to run farther, which doesn't always work out too well for me either. And I tried to eat right. Tried, tried to do things to change my body so I could maybe just get this edge. So the competition comes around, and sure enough, the hard work that I put in started to pay off. Because you know, I, the first event, I, I hit a personal record. The second event, I do it again. The other three events that day, I felt really confident about. And then by the end of the first day, I'm beating this guy. And I'm so excited. I'm pumped up because it's going to happen. My hard work is paying off. It's real. Come back in the second day, I'm having another really, I'm, I'm having a successful day, uh, hitting new marks that I haven't hit before. I'm pumped up. And we're going into the last event, which is the mile. Now, I'm not a distance runner. I never have been a distance runner. And it's not necessarily um, the most enjoyable thing in the world to just run far. In a mile, I know for some people, it's like, oh, that's short. That's nothing. But for me, that is like running to Canada and back. It just, it just it horrified me. Because you get exhausted right away. You've already done nine events. But I look at the scores before we go in, and I'm beating this guy by 24 points. I'm like, oh, it's going to happen. But I knew that I was going to have to push myself a little bit harder because he was the best miler in our decathlon group. And if he beat me by any more than 4.7 seconds, not that I was keeping track, he was going to beat me. So I knew I had to stay within 4.7 seconds of this guy. So I'm like, all right, Danny, you've trained. You've done everything. And I, I look at some of his scores from, from earlier in the week. I look it up really quick. I noticed that he'd been running about like a 4.35. And I'm like, OK, that's not good because I'm running about a five-minute mile. That, that just doesn't work out for me. So I'm like, all right. Danny, zone in here. You're going to need to improve by 20 seconds. If you can improve by 20 seconds, it's going to happen. And everything you've ever dreamed for, it's going to work. You, you will be complete, if you will. So the race starts, and I'm chasing this guy right from the beginning. I'm staying right on his shoulder. Even at one point, I maybe got ahead of him by just an inch. 
I'm standing side by side. I have the inside lane, so I have the advantage. He's running next to me. I'm just watching his shoulder, trying to keep up. By the, by the, end, of the, by the end of the third lap, he starts to pull away, so I start to chase him. He had more left in me, so he starts to break away, but I know. I'm like, I'm within 4.7 seconds. There's no doubt about it. We're coming around the back straightaway, and I'm sprinting as hard as I can. I'm giving everything I have. Just, oh, if I could just get this, I will be happy. If I could just get this, he's breaking away a little bit more. We cross the finish line. I look at the score. It says 440, and I'm like, yeah, I did it. I beat it by 20 seconds. It happened. I succeeded, and I threw my arms up in the air, and I'm so excited. I'm like, there's no way he beat me. There's no way he got ahead of me, and I feel full. But then um, in the decathlon, they can print off the scores very, very quickly, and they can put the scores on the scoreboard very, very quickly. And I look up, um, and, and, and it's distorted, and I notice that the scores are wrong. They're showing like those guys, so I'm like, scampering. I'm, they're just, I'm like, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Somebody hands me a sheet. I look at the sheet. I lost by one point. One point, which in other words is about 0.6 seconds in the mile. So if I would have started a little bit quicker, if I would have finished a little bit harder, if I would have anything, I would have beaten him. I would have done it. And so the reality of this sets in because this is my last event ever. I have no other chances at this. I can't ever do it again. So I, I, I freak out. I'm 21 years old, and I'm freaking out. I go to the ground. I rip out grass. I slam it. I'm making a complete fool of myself because everything that I lived for the entire track season was building up to this point, and I failed. And frankly, that's what it's like in our lives a lot of the time. We do everything we can to get full. We do everything we can to achieve our goals. And even when we put our best foot forward, even when we do better than we've ever done before, like I did in that decathlon, we still somehow fall short and we're left feeling empty. We try to fill up and we try to succeed on our own and we try to succeed with what the world has to offer us and we just feel empty because it just doesn't cut it. So I'm on the ground and I'm really upset. I'm not proud of the things that I'm saying, but I look up and sure enough, coming to the finish line, walking there with his arms open, I look up, and it's, it's my dad. You know, he, he came to so many track meets. He came even, he was a pastor, um, but uh, so on weekends he would preach, but he still would come to the track meets. He'd always be there. And I look up, and I see him coming to the finish line. And like I said, you know, I'm, I'm 21, and that comes with a little bit of pride sometimes. You want to sometimes act a little bit cooler than you are, but I just don't even care. At this point, I stand up, and I'm just crying. And I walk over to my dad, and he's a really tall guy, so I just bury my head in his chest, and I just hug him, and I'm crying. And I'm feeling so silly because every, there's, I don't know, it's a D3 sports, like 20 people around watching. But nonetheless, they're watching. I'm feeling ridiculous, but I'm in my father's arms. When I felt empty, when I felt dead, when I felt like I completely failed, there was my father to make me complete again. And he held me in his arms. I'll just never forget the three simple sentences that he said to me. First, he said, I'm proud of you. Next, he said, I love you. And he said, I'm so glad you're my son. Even though I lost, even though I couldn't do it on my own, even when I put my best foot forward, there's our Father saying, I'm here. Come into my arms. Let me lift you up. Let me hold you up. So I encourage you in your life, in your walk with Jesus, and I encourage myself as well because I, I mean, I'm always in a broken spot. You know, I mean, we come to church, we, we, you know, we participate in things, I work at a camp, but we still experience brokenness all the time. We get distracted by the world and we try to fill up but I encourage you, at the end of that race, you know, at the end of the day, when, when you realize that, you know, I, I didn't get the raise, or maybe I did get the raise, but my family's still not necessarily happy. I'm still not fulfilling their needs. You know, I, you know, I didn't make the A-team, or I did make the A-team, but I'm still not satisfied. You know, I, I, I didn't get the A on the paper, or I did get the A on the paper but it still doesn't fill me up. I still need more. Turn your eyes to Jesus. Take your burdens to him. Take your struggles to him. Take your emptiness to him. In Colossians 3, it talks about let the peace of Jesus consume your heart. And that's what makes you happy. That's what changes you. That's what takes away the sinful nature in your life and puts on the good things in your life. Jesus can make you complete. All you need is the love of him in your heart to be controlling. In Romans chapter 6, it talks about how we really don't have control over our actions. Instead, it's instead, either sin has control over us or God has control over us. So if we let Jesus make us full, 
Sin doesn't have control. We don't have control. It's us opening up our hearts, the free will of opening up our hearts, saying, Jesus, pour through me, fill me up, fill me up so full that I'm overflowing to the world around me. I want to spread your love. I want to spread your message. I want to bring people to you. Because that's the only thing that we'll do. Sometimes, when you just can't do it on your own, you have to go to the Father. Not sometimes, excuse me, all the time. Because even when our best foot is forward, still fall short. We still can't make it. Let Jesus lift you up. Let Jesus hold you up and let him make you complete. He wants to do that for you. And no matter how old we are or how young we are, we have the opportunity to open our heart and let Jesus in. And then let him overflow. Will you please pray with me? Uh, God, um, I thank you for your power and your wonder um, and just your ability to fill us up, God, in ways that we can't necessarily understand. I pray that as we go out into the world after this service, um, we're able to avoid the distractions, um, but also address them and help out other people with them. But, but most of all, God, um, just please overflow us. Make us complete. Fill us up. Overflow out of our bodies. Um, and, uh, and just take over our lives so that uh, we might be able to impact the lives of other people because you're working through us. Uh, we love you so much, and we thank you for your offering to us of, of making us complete. Amen.